Hello, everyone. Welcome to the webinar on juvenile spondyloarthritis and juvenile psoriatic arthritis. This webinar is brought to you by CAPES, Clinician and Patient Education Series, a collaboration of the National Psoriasis Foundation, Group for Research and Assessment of Psoriasis and Psoriatic Arthritis, also called GRAPA, Spondyloarthritis Research and Network uh, Treatment Network called Spartan, and Spondylitis Association of America called SAA, supported by an educational grant from Pfizer. Next slide, please. I'm Hema Srinivasalu, pediatric rheumatologist at Children's National Hospital at Washington, D.C., and associate professor of pediatrics at GW School of Medicine. I have the honor of moderating this session. I'm joined by an expert panel today. Here is our agenda. We'll begin with patient perspective by Wendy Olster Asad Khan and his mom, Amina Hamid. Wendy is a PhD student in Netherlands. She was diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis when she was 14 years old. She's on vacation and hence is not able to participate during the live Q&A, but we thank Wendy for her story. Asad Khan is a 16-year-old high school sophomore who lives in central New Jersey. Asad was diagnosed with ankylosing spondylitis when he was just nine years old. Amina Hamid is Asad's mom. She's an educator and has been on this journey since Asad so showed his first symptoms. We thank this uh, patient panel uh, to be part of this webinar today. Our clinicians include Dr. Dax Ramsey. He's the Zone Ch Section Chief of Pediatric Rheumatology at Stollery Children's Hospital, Alberta, Canada. He's the Division Director of Pediatric Rheumatology and Associate Professor uh, at University of Alberta, Canada. We are also joined by Dr. Pam Weiss, who is the Clinical Research Director at the Division of Rheumatology at Children's Na Hospital of Philadelphia, and Dr. Matt Stoll, who is the Associate Professor in Pediatric Rheumatology at University of Alabama at Birmingham. These, uh, next slide, please. These are the planner disclosures. Next slide. These are the faculty disclosures. Next slide. This program is accredited for 1.5 AMA PRA Category 1 credits. We'll now proceed with pre-test quest uh, questions, followed by patient perspective and clinician presentations. Next slide. Question 1. Which of the following conditions is not typically considered to be in the juvenile spondyloarthritis family of related diseases? Answer choices are A, enthesitis-related arthritis, B, juvenile psoriatic arthritis, C, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, D, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, and E, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Please answer now. Okay, moving on to the next question. Question two, which of the following can be challenging to interpret on the pelvic MRI in skeletally immature patients? Choose all that apply. Answer choices, A, bone marrow edema, B, fat metaplasia, C, erosion, D, capsulitis. Please answer now. Question three, which of the following statements is correct? Answer choices, A, compared to adults, children are at higher risk of developing serious infections following exposure to TNF inhibitors. B, IL-17 inhibition with agents such as rodalumab or secukinumab is generally contraindicated in children with inflammatory bowel disease. C, baseline enthesitis is a predictor of improved functional outcomes in children with JIA and D, Children with ERA are more likely compared to children with other categories of JIA to enter remission following exposure to TNF inhibition. Please answer now. Now, without further ado, we will begin the uh, patient perspective, journal diagnosis and treatment. Hi, I'm Wendy Olster, a PhD student at the Eindhoven University of Technology in the Netherlands. I had my first symptoms when I was 14 years old and was diagnosed with juvenile psoriatic arthritis about two years later. Uh, hello, everyone. My name is Asad Khan. I'm a junior in high school and I live in New Jersey. I had symptoms around the age of two and was diagnosed with juvenile spondyloarthritis at the age, when, at the age of nine. 
Hi, I'm Amina Hamid. I'm Asad's mom. I'm an educator and homeschooling mom of three. I have been by Asad's side since the beginning of his journey with ankylosing spondylitis and learning as I go through his experience with his symptoms, diagnosis, challenges thus far. So Asad, you were diagnosed at a very young age. What was your disease history and diagnosis like? Well, when I was around two years old, uh, my mom noticed that I was limping when I walked. The limping, the limping would come and go. Around four, I stopped walking suddenly due to pain in my knee. Doctors uh, ended up finding fluid in my knee, so I was given a steroid injection to help calm things down. And then the pain had gone away until I was around nine years old, and then it came back even stronger than before. We went to many specialists, but it took a very long time to figure out what was going on. And then finally, we went to a rheumatologist and we got tested. I was diagnosed with juvenile spondyloarthritis right after that. It was certainly a challenging time not knowing what was causing us its symptoms since they started so early in life. Once he was diagnosed, we felt relief at least knowing what was going on for so long and could finally look into paths for treatment. So Wendy, how was your uh, juvenile uh, psoriatic arthritis finally recognized? So for me, it also took a very long time to figure out what was going on. It started when I was 14 years old and I began having a lot of pain in my hips and my neck. I saw a pediatrician and multiple orthopedists, but none of them could really figure out what was going on. They even told me that I was too young to have a type of arthritis. And after more than two years of visiting hospitals, I finally visited a rheumatologist who could diagnose me with juvenile psoriatic arthritis as the joint cartilage of my hip was broken down due to all the flares. For me, it was also a major relief, just like you, to finally get the confirmation of my diagnosis. So uh, how was your treatment journey like? So after my diagnosis, I was put on an anti-TNF agent. I remember the first time we had to do the injection, it took over 40 minutes because we were just not ready and it felt very scary. So from making sure we were inserting the needle into my thigh correctly, injecting it, and then it would, uh, keeping the needle in my leg for 15 to 20 seconds so that all the medicine was in my leg. And then we would have to take the needle out. It felt like my leg was burning the entire time the needle was in my leg and the medication was going in. But after a while, uh, I learned how to deal with the pain since I had to administer the injection every other week. And soon I switched over to a pen. And so we started using that instead of the injection and it made a world of a difference to me. Um, it's easier because I don't have to do any of the work and it also definitely hurts a lot less. And I also had methotrexate, methotrexate added two years later as well. Uh, so has responded well to the medication, thankfully, and has been continuing with the same treatment. Um, he's now able to keep up with his peers and play sports, etc. I'm very happy you responded well to the medication. My treatment journey was a bit different as I tried a lot of different treatment options before I had the right one. I started with NSI days and steroid injections, but they only helped short term. I also tried a lot of different types of anti-TNF drugs, but I either developed antibodies or had a lot of side effects. And it took me years to try all these options. Luckily, I am now treated with an IL-17 inhibitor, which works great. So looking back at your experience, what would be the final message you would like to share? So for, for people who are uh, newly diagnosed, the disease and treatment may seem very daunting, and, but there are a number of medications that have helped many patients. And in my case, the treatment has been effect effective for the last seven years. And I'm hopeful that with continued research in this field, there will be advancements, many more advancements and one day cure. I agree. In the beginning, it feels like a lot, and it's important to know that you're not alone in what you're experiencing. It's always okay to ask for help, and we're lucky that although sometimes it can take a long time to fight, find the right one, there are a lot of treatment options available. Thank you for allowing us to share our stories. Hi there, my name is Dax Ramsey, and I'm a pediatric rheumatologist in Edmonton, Alberta, Canada. And today I'm going to talk about juvenile spondylarthritis, clinical presentation, and classification. 
So in terms of the objectives for today, by the end of this session, I'm hoping that you as the learner will be able to recognize a patient who may be presenting with a form of juvenile spondylarthritis, describe the main clinical features of JSPA, understand the current classification of JSPA, and recognize that this is an evolving area of pediatric rheumatology. So we'll start with the case. So this is the story of a 14-year-old young man named Edward R. Appleton, or ERA for short. This is a picture of him right there. So he presents to the clinic with lower back stiffness for the past five months, as well as bilateral heel pain. So just a note here in terms of pediatric patients. So children can be poor historians. They don't always, they're not always able to describe their pain as well as adults. And sometimes um, they don't even complain of any symptoms. Also, the sacroiliac area can be called the hip by some of these patients. So you have to be really astute in your history taking. So in terms of history for Edward, just think about what you would ask this patient on history, what you would ask about in family history, and what kind of things would you look for on physical exam? All right, so getting into history, I would wanna ask him about the onset and the duration of his symptoms in terms of the back pain and also the heel pain. Um, features of the back pain, like trying to get at whether it sounds inflammatory versus mechanical. So in terms of inflammatory, be more likely to be stiff in the morning, uh, more likely to wake at night with the pain. And sometimes they get alternating buttocks pain versus mechanical pain would be more likely to be worse after uh, physical activity um, and less likely stiff in the morning. Um, and I'd also ask about any preceding injuries or preceding illness, such as like is including uh, gastrointestinal infection or GU infection. I'd also ask about some extra articular features such as eye symptoms, thinking of things like acute uveitis. So I'd ask about, is there any redness or pain or photophobia of the eyes? Any GI symptoms, any oral ulcers or any rashes, including like a psoriatic type rash. And also if there's any treatments he's tried like medications or physiotherapy, chiropractor, any of that, those things and the results, like did any of that help his symptoms? And then thinking of family history, I'd mostly be focusing on uh, HLA B27 related diseases. Was there anyone else in his family that he knew of that got diagnosed with a juvenile spondylarthritis? Anyone with ankylosing spondylitis? Any family members with inflammatory bowel disease or IBD related arthritis? <clears throat> anyone else that he knew of that had acute uveitis or the eye inflammation? Anyone with psoriasis or like uh, pr um, preferably physician diagnosed psoriasis or psoriatic arthritis? Um, and any other autoimmune, autoinflammatory or rheumatic diseases? In terms of the physical exam, uh, I'd wanna do a, a good general physical exam like in all patients and also to check all of their joints, but certain things to focus on for this patient in particular, I'd want to do a good foot and ankle exam. And in the upper right hand or the upper left hand picture, this is kind of uh, depicting arth or arthritis of the left ankle and also enthesitis at the Achilles attachment. Um, in the upper middle picture, this is showing the modified Schober test, which is looking at lumbar range of motion, which can be limited in, in these patients. And then the upper right is the Faber test, which stands for flexion, abduction, and external rotation. And this is a maneuver to stress the SI joint. And a positive test would be pain in the, the SI joint. Then something that you probably won't see on exam, but, you, but it would be a very good clue to the diagnosis would be some of these eye findings if they had an episode of acute uveitis. So redness of the eye, uh, irregularly shaped pupil due to synechiae, which are like uh, which is when the, uh, the iris adheres to the lens from the inflammation in the eye. And then this bottom picture here is showing some common sites of enthesitis around the patella, antibial tuberosity, the Achilles attachment, and the plantar fascia attachment on the bottom of the foot. And then this is just a table and a figure from our textbook of pediatric rheumatology showing a lot of the common sites of enthesitis, both in the upper and lower limbs. So just the clinical pearl, to check for enthesitis in terms of the amount of pressure that you should apply, uh, you should ideally apply about 40 pounds per inch squared of thumb pressure. 
or basically until like you push until the thumbnail blanches, which is a good pearl. So just moving into the next section on classification. <clears throat> just a quick question. So what is the most likely rheumatic diagnosis that Edward has? Assuming that his back pain is from in, um, sacroiliitis and he has this uh, heel pain, which is due to anthesitis. So do you think it's anthesitis related arthritis, a thing called seronegative anthesopathy and arthropathy or C syndrome, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, juvenile spondyloarthritis, all of the above, none of the above, or too many acronyms, I'm out. So what do you think? So this kind of highlights an issue uh, with our specialty in this area that there's many different names for similar conditions. So first of all, there's a thing called ERA or enthesitis related arthritis, which is one of the categories of juvenile arthritis under the ILR classification system, which is International League Against Rheumatism, and this is the most commonly used classification system. So to be classified um, as having ERA, a patient would have to have either arthritis and enthesitis, or arthritis or enthesitis, and two or more of the following features. So those features would be sacroiliac joint tenderness and or inflammatory lumbosacral pain, presence of HLA-B27, onset of arthritis in an older boy, so a boy after the age of six, a family history of one of those HLA-B27 associated diseases, um, and having acute symptomatic anterior uveitis. So more than two of those. Uh, some of the exclusion criteria for this category would be if the patient or their first degree relative had psoriasis, if the patient had a positive rheumatoid factor in their blood test, if they present it with systemic arthritis, or if they had arthritis fulfilling two of the categories of juvenile arthritis. Next is a syndrome called C syndrome. And this is from a paper published back in the, in the early 80s, so like in 1982, by Dr. Alan Rosenberg and Dr. Ross Petty, who are two classic pediatric rheumatologists in Canada. Um, and this is called a syndrome of seronegative enthesopathy and arthropathy in children. And they basically described a lot of their patients that they had seen in Winnipeg and Vancouver, Canada. And they noticed that there's kind of a difference between some of these patients who had uh, enthesitis and inflammatory back symptoms, as opposed to their other patients with juvenile arthritis. They described the syndrome. And then I just kind of threw in another name. So this is Dr. Shirley C. And she's a juvenile spondyl arthritis expert in Canada. So maybe we should also call it C syndrome. Next, um, there's, a, there's a title called Juvenile Ankylosing Spondylitis or Juvenile ax Axial Spondylarthritis. And this is basically a term used to describe those patients who fulfill the category for ankylosing spondylitis prior to their 16th birthday. And that's either radiographic or non-radiographic. So this, um, they could, could fulfill either the 1984 modified New York criteria or the newer ASAS criteria for axial spa. Uh, not a lot of our patients actually get back x-rays. They would more likely to get MRIs. So it'd be unlikely that they'd actually fulfill the 1984 criteria, but that would be like having clinical criteria and also radiologic criteria. And that's when you look at the x-rays and you'd see either unilateral severe sacroiliitis or bilateral moderate to severe. And then the ASAS criteria, um, they fulfill that if they have three or more months of back pain and age of onset less than 45 years, which would be all of our patients with the age category, or criterion rather. Um, and then they, for this, they need sacroiliitis on imaging and one or more spa feature, or they could be HLA-B27 positive and have two or more other spa features. So there's a lot of terms. So the next term is called juvenile spondyloarthritis, and this is kind of an umbrella term. And this is usually thought of as including the ILAR criteria categories of ERA and psoriatic JIA and plus or minus undifferentiated JIA. So <clears throat> ERA, we already talked about, psoriatic juvenile arthritis, that's when you have uh, arthritis and psoriasis, or you have arthritis and two out of the three of these other criterion, which are uh, having a family history and a first degree relative of psoriasis, uh, 
having dactylitis, which is basically like the sausage digit, or having nail changes, uh, which include nail pitting or onchalysis. And the undifferentiated juvenile arthritis category <clears throat> is when a patient doesn't neatly fit into any of the other categories or they get excluded because they fit more than one category. So, um, for example, if a patient was diagnosed with ERA, they met all those criteria, but they happen to have a family first degree relative with, with psoriasis, then they'd automatically be excluded from the ERA classification uh, category, and they would be called undifferentiated. So <clears throat> as you can see, the whole juvenile spondyl arthritis is not really well dealt with by ILAR, and there's a lot of patients that end up in this undifferentiated category. So there's actually a move to create a new classification system for juvenile arthritis, and that's being developed. So in terms of the epidemiology, among children with juvenile arthritis in general, about 10 to 20 percent have ERA. In terms of juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, where they have true like uh, axial disease, it's been found that about one to seven percent of children with juvenile arthritis in several uh, large national cohorts in the US, Canada, UK, and Europe have this axial disease. Uh, the age of onset is usually a bit older for the kids. It's usually on average about 13 years of age, as opposed to some of our other patients with juvenile arthritis that present a lot earlier on. Um, ERA has a predominance of boys usually, so it's up to nine to one, uh, boys to girls, depending on the country you look at. And then juvenile, ax, uh, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, or so truly having the axial disease, has a male to female ratio of about seven to one. Having said this though, it's likely underdiagnosed in girls, this condition. And the, some of the evidence for that is that HLA-B27 is very strongly associated with the disease and it's found to be about equally prevalent in girls and boys. So that's the main presentation. If there's any questions, I'm happy to take any. Thanks. Thank you to the organizers of this meeting for giving me a chance to speak with you for the next couple of minutes on the imaging pitfalls in the evaluation of juvenile spinal arthritis with a focus on axial disease. Over the next couple of minutes, we'll be focusing on two specific objectives. One, to learn the age-related changes that make axial disease imaging challenging in youth and two, to discuss a few age-specific mimics of axial inflammation in youth. So a question that I get all the time um, at meetings and also in clinic are, is spinal arthritis really a problem in kids? And my answer is always, yes, it really is. So we know that um, up to 20% of adults with ankylosing spondylitis have symptom onset prior to age 18. We also know that spinal arthritis accounts for up to 20% of juvenile arthritis. Treatment for this disease is often suboptimal. Um, and less than 20% of children and adolescents with spinal arthritis achieve remission within five years of diagnosis. And of course, because it's pediatrics, we have fewer drugs available for treatment than are available for adults with the same condition. When we focus on just axial disease, again, as I told you on the last slide, up to 20% of adults with ankylosing spondylitis actually have disease onset before age 18. And we know of those kids with juvenile spinal arthritis, up to 20% of them develop sacroiliitis within several years of diagnosis. In comparison to adults with spinal arthritis, back pain and stiffness are relatively uncommon in kids. And I'm showing you the data from uh, an older but very important study um, below. And as you can see here, the major differences between juvenile onset and adult onset spinal arthritis are that back pain is much less common in children, root joint or um, joint arthritis like hips is more common in children, um, and peripheral arthritis is a much more frequent manifestation in children than it is in adults. So the question then becomes, when do we start to worry about sacroiliitis? Should we look for it at diagnosis? Well, we set out to answer this question and evaluated 40 unselected children, meaning consecutive children were approached uh, with a new diagnosis of spinal arthritis, regardless of whether or not they had any complaints of back pain. 
Um, and these children that were enrolled had a diagnosis of SPA within the last six months. And all of these children underwent MRI. And what we found were that eight of 40 children or 20% of our cases had evidence of sacroiliitis within the first six months of disease. On the top table, I'm showing the difference between the groups and a handful of clinical metrics that we collected. And as you can see by the p-values, there really weren't any significant differences between the two groups. We also collected some serologies, including HLA B27 and inflammatory markers. And using these tests, I show you in the table on the bottom, we were able to show the predictive probability of kids having sacroiliitis. And as you can see, if children were HLA B27 negative and had a normal CRP, the likelihood of having sacroiliitis was pretty darn low at 0.01. However, if the CRP was elevated and the HLA B27 was positive, that predicted probability went up to 0.84. So this study showed us that one, we needed to be concerned about sacroiliitis at disease onset, again, affecting 20% of kids. We found that 50% of the children had bilateral disease. What was really scary was a good majority of the children with um, inflammation also had evidence of damage. Um, and what was really tricky was that of the eight children who had um, sacroiliitis on imaging, only three of them actually complained of back pain. So that's where the predictive probability actually comes into play and may help you figure out who really should be screened. So now that I told you we need to look for sacroiliitis, how good are we actually right now in terms of identifying it? So this is a study in which eight hospitals across the U.S. each contributed up to 20 cases of consecutively imaged children and adolescents with juvenile arthritis and suspected sacroiliitis. Each of the MRI studies were reviewed by a panel of three uh, experienced pediatric radiologists. And the test properties of the local reports were calculated using the central imaging team's assessment as the reference standard. So as you can see on this table, the sensitivity of the local reports for active sacroiliitis on MRI was actually quite high and varied from 80 to 100% across sites with an overall sensitivity of 93.5%. So this was really good, meaning very few cases of sacroiliitis were missed. However, the positive predictive value of the local reports ranged very widely from 12.5% to 100% with an overall positive predictive value of only 52%, meaning there were a lot of false positives. So why all these false positives? Well, it turns out that normal maturational changes are pretty tricky. Um, and if you're not used to looking at um, adults, um, adolescent studies, some of the normal maturational changes can actually be confused for inflammation. Um, as shown by the yellow, hour, um, yellow arrows here, um, maturational, maturational changes consist of bright apophysial cartilage. I'm sorry, and this is a, an a imaging from an 11 year old healthy boy. So in, uh, in one study, we actually uh, aimed to quantify the maturational changes over time. So we used images prospectively collected on 70 healthy children ages 8 to 18 years. Uh, my colleague, Nancy Chauvin, developed an ordinal system that grades the amount of subchondral signal in the maturing skeleton from 1 to 4, shown here on this slide. And the take home points from this study were that children progress from type one to four as they approach adulthood. The metaphysical equivalent signal in healthy children is typically homogeneous, symmetric, and primarily on the sacrum. So on the left, I'm showing you a key example of this. So type one change is characterized by homogeneous bright subchondral signal extending along the sacral apophy apophyses. Types one and two signal were present in most prepubertal children. And type four, which is present in the kids who are almost adults, is essentially equivalent to the normal imaging that we see in adults. And we think that this metaphysical equivalent signal change is really conversion of the physiologic red marrow along the articular surfaces with advancing age. But you can see how people who aren't used to looking at adolescent images might see that apophysial signal as inflammation and wrongly conclude that the patient has inflammatory sacroiliitis. So you really need to be careful. 
This is another way of showing the same data. So again, on the left, what you can see is that the prepubertal children predominantly have type 1 and type 2 signal. And by the time the children approach skeletal maturity, there is no detectable type 1 signal, and type 2 signal is present in less than 10%. So MRI can also be tricky in uh, youth for other reasons. So as part of the same prospective study of 70 healthy kids, the prevalence of cortical irregularities was also evaluated. And it turns out that sacroiliac joint cortical irregularities are pretty common, um, but there's some patterns that we can all recognize. So the cortical irregularities occur most often along the ilium and are most numerous, again, in that period pubertal group. Um, and these findings correlate with prior autopsy findings, which report that the sacroiliac bony surfaces are smooth right up until puberty, and thereafter develop bony ridges and grooves, primarily on the ilium. Now, cortical ir irregularities, as many of you know, can also be seen in adults, um, but in that population, irregularities sometimes infer degenerative change, which we obviously would not expect to see in our younger population. So it's just important to recognize these features as variation in normal anatomy so that, um, that they're not mistaken for erosions, um, prompting our patients to unnecessarily be put on medications. And here I'm just I'm showing you an arrow to two of these cortical um, irregularities, which again, to, to many of us would, would look like erosion. So now I wanna move on to describe some age-specific mimics that you should keep in mind. So our first case is a nine-year-old female uh, who presented with acute onset left hip and buttock pain for one week. She described the pain in the left hip and lateral thigh and buttock as throbbing and constant. Uh, she had been hit by a soccer ball before the pain had started, but had no visible bruising to indicate that it was a severe injury. She had minimal response to ibuprofen. She had no other joint complaints um, and had a fairly unremarkable past medical history. On serologic evaluation, she had normal or negative uh, CBC, CMP, rheumatoid factor, and HLA-B27. Pertinent abnormal um, serologies were that she had a lot of inflammation. Both her CRP and ESR were elevated, and the ESR was actually elevated to a greater extent than the CRP. On imaging, her X-ray of the pelvis was unremarkable. So now I'm showing you the MRI. Um, that was done on this young patient. So on the left STIR imaging, you can see bone marrow edema on both sides of the left SIJ, a fairly sizable joint effusion, and you also see edema in the gluteus musculature, which is uplifting the iliac muscle. On the image on the right, we see multiple prominent bilateral inguinal nodes which you really would not expect to see in, in inflammatory sacroiliitis from JSPA. So what did this patient ultimately have? Serologies came back consistent with Bartonella or catch scratch infection, which again, maybe not highest on your differential because this patient came in complaining of injury after soccer. Um, but um, on further questioning, um, after this imaging was obtained, um, the patient actually said that she had played with a kitten at the neighbor's house on numerous occasions. So what do we know about Bartonella um, and sacroiliitis? We know that 10% um, of Bartonella infections result in MSK manifestations, and these can vary. They include myalgia, arthritis, arthralgia, and less commonly, tendonitis, osteomyelitis, and neuralgia. In terms of which joints are most frequently affected, it's mostly knee, ankle, wrist, hand, and elbows. So sacroiliitis is not um, at the top of that, but certainly something that you need to keep in mind, especially with a atypical features that don't really fit with inflammatory sacroiliitis. And in this case, I would say is the acute onset, lack of response to ibuprofen, you have imaging findings showing inflammation in adjacent musculature, as well as prominent lymph nodes. The second age-related case is a 16-year-old male presenting with arthralgia, myalgia, and acne. And so this is a 16-year-old severe acne on the face and upper back. And one month after starting retinoic acid, developed pain in the lower extremities, gluteal region, and lower back. And he reported um, when he came to see um, 
the rheumatologist that this pain had been present for at least two months at this point, was a little bit responsive to NSAIDs. On family history, there was a paternal aunt who had inflammatory bowel disease. On physical exam, he had some tenderness with direct palpation of the sacred iliac joint and along the posterior iliac crest. And on laboratory evaluation, he had a normal or negative HLA B27, CBC, CMP, and ESR. And pertinent abnormal um, serologies were that the CRP was slightly elevated. So what did we see on imaging? So on T1, which is the image on the left, um, the findings are actually looking fairly normal. Um, on STIRT imaging on the right, we see bilateral sacral subchondral edema consistent with sacroiliitis. So what do we know about sacroiliitis and retinoic acid? We know that there's an association with cumulative dose of medication and lower back pain, and in some cases, obviously, sacroiliitis. In one small case series, sacroiliitis that was seen after initiation of retinoic acid was bilateral in the vast majority of cases. And we also know that if the retinoic acid is stopped, the symptoms associated with sacroiliitis and the imaging findings um, resolved fairly quickly. Um, but by fairly quickly, I mean a couple of weeks. So in summary, Axial disease affects 20% of juvenile spa patients and is a major problem. MRI of the pelvis is a key part of the assessment of sacroiliitis in youth. The sacroiliac joint in maturing children and adolescents looks different than in adults, and you need to become familiar with this, as do your radiologists. Age-related changes make axial disease um, challenging. In particular, the subcaudral edema that's seen as normal maturation and cortical irregularities. And mimics of sacroiliitis to consider specifically in youth and the adolescent population that you may not consider in your adult patients are cat scratch disease and retinoic acid induced sacroiliitis. So with that, I wanna say thank you. Uh, I have a lot of collaborators who have contributed to the research that I'm presenting to you today that are all listed here as well as some um, very generous funders. Um, and I look forward to taking your questions. Hi, I am Matthew Stoll. I am a pediatric rheumatologist at the University of Alabama at Birmingham. And my topic is the treatment and outcome of juvenile spondyloarthritis. I will begin with treatment. And here are my learning objectives. There are two prospective studies in psoriatic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. The first was the Clipper intercept open label study. And the second one was a junior para randomized controlled study of secukinumab in both enthesitis related arthritis and psoriatic arthritis. The Clipper study was an open label study of children with extended oligoarticular JIA, psoriatic JIA, and ERA who were treated with etanercept. This bondular arthritis patients were aged 12 to 17 at baseline with a mean disease duration of less than two years. The initial outcome assessment was performed at 12 weeks, with long-term follow-up most recently published for six years. And here's the entirety of the data up to six years. You can see that they responded quickly. All three groups did, but more or less equally, and they maintained this response for six years. The other study that included children with psoriatic arthritis was the Junipera study of secukinumab and j -SPA. This was a withdrawal phase study of secukinumab in 97 children with ERA or psoriatic arthritis. 86 of them received at least one dose. The mean age of the participants was 13.7 years for the ERA group and 12.2 years for the psoriatic arthritis group. All 86 patients received secukinumab open label for up to 12 weeks. The responders were randomized to secukinumab versus placebo for up to 100 weeks, and the primary endpoint of this study was time to flare. So this is the open label phase where all children received secukinumab, and what this shows is on the y-axis, the outcome is the J-27, which is an outcome measure used in pediatric rheumatology and juvenile arthritis, 
that includes the active joint count, the patient global, and the MD global. And you can see that both groups responded well in this time period. So then the responders were randomized to continue on secukinumab or to be treated with placebo for up to 100 weeks. Any children, any child who flared well on placebo was then assigned to study drug open label. And what this shows is that the y-axis is the proportion of patients who flared during this period of time, and the x-axis is days. And what this shows is that over time, the children who received the placebo were more likely to flare compared to those who were maintained on the study drug with a hazard ratio of 0 0.28. So that is it for prospective studies in psoriatic arthritis. There are five prospective studies in emphasizes related arthritis. These are summarized on this table, and I will go through them one by one. So we're all interested, I know, to hear about sulfasalazine. So both groups, this is a randomized trial that was completed in 2002. Both groups, the placebo and the treatment arm, demonstrated improvements in active joint count and the situs count and the pain visual analog scale, but there were not differences between the two groups. The only significant improvements were seen in the patient and MD global, that's shown in the table below, where the self salazing group were more likely to have overall improvement in both outcome measures as compared to those who received placebo. Next is adalimumab. This is a um, randomized trial where the outcome assessment was performed at 12 weeks. And the outcome in this case was the active joint count. And what's shown here is that the patients who received um, study drug were, had a lower active joint count or a greater change in active joint count compared to those who received, received placebo at the end point of 12 weeks. And then they did converge over 52 weeks when the placebo arm received the study drug open label. This is a Tenercep study. This was also a withdrawal phase study for the first 24 weeks. All children received a Tenercep open label. And you can see here, this table summarizes that overall the children improved with the Tenercep. And then the uh, responders were assigned to either a tenorcept or placebo in a randomized fashion. And the output in was time to flare. And what you can see is that the children who were maintained on a tenorcept were less likely to flare with a p-value of 0 0.021 as compared to those who received placebo during this time. The Inflitzmap study was completed in 2007, but has not yet been published. I am hopeful that we will see some data in the not too distant future. There were two treatment arms in Flixmap versus placebo. Only 26 subjects were enrolled and the information about the study is available online at clinicaltrials.gov and the link is shown here. The primary outcome is at week 12 with an open label extension up to week 52. With fairly limited data, prospective data on the treatment of spinal arthritis in children, the question emerges, can we extrapolate from adult studies? And I would argue that we can if there is sufficient safety data of, this, of the drug in children and from an effectiveness standpoint, whether the disease process is similar in adult versus the pediatric subjects. First, I'll begin with safety. And there are two important safety events that we review with our patients, infections and malignancies. So for infections, there are I'm comparing registry data in patients with juvenile arthritis who've been treated with TNF inhibitors and patients with rheumatoid arthritis who've also been treated with TNF inhibitors. And the BICRA study is in children with JIA. The BSRBR registry is in adults with rheumatoid arthritis. And what this shows here is that serious infections um, and both of them use similar definitions for what constitutes a serious infection, were somewhat higher in the adult patients as compared to the children. And this is likely because adults are more likely to have comorbidities that are going to put you at higher risk of infections 
However, the important point is that bottom line here is that our patients with JAA generally tolerate these medications uh, from an infection standpoint. With respect to malignancies, uh, Timothy Buchelman studied this issue in 2018. He looked at 90,000 children with either inflammatory bowel disease, psoriasis, or juvenile hepatic arthritis. Of these, about 15,000 were treated with TNF inhibitors, the rest were not. What he found is that the incidence of malignancies was slightly higher among those who received TNF inhibitors compared to those who did not. And that held whether you looked at all malignancies or specifically if you looked at those as lymphoma. However, this difference was not statistically significant. Additionally, he argued that some of this difference could have been due to confounding by indication. Overall, I would say this data is highly reassuring that, that while there may be a higher incidence of malignancies among those receiving TNF inhibitors, the overall risk of cancer among children whether or not they are on TNF inhibitors is very low. So now we can speak to effectiveness. And the question then is, are the disease mechanisms in spinal arthritis and ERA and psoriatic arthritis similar to those in adults? For ERA, I would argue that the answer is yes, that the Spinal arthritis in childhood is very similar to its counterpart in adults based upon demographics, joint distribution, the presence of intestinal inflammation, and genetics. What about psoriatic arthritis? So here it's likely more complicated. There have been several studies over the years showing that children with psoriatic arthritis have a bimodal age of onset distribution, where there's a peak in early childhood around age two or three, then second peak in mid to late adolescence. So we and others have compared the clinical features of late onset versus early onset psoriatic arthritis. And what we found is that only the late onset group resembles spinal arthritis in adults. The early onset children are more likely to be female, to have small joint disease, a positive ANA, and to have chronic silent uveitis whereas late onset children are more likely to be male. They have more enthesitis, frank psoriasis, oligoarthritis, axial disease, HLA-B27 positivity, and overweight obesity. Because of that, I would argue that we can extrapolate from a treatment in adult studies for the late onset psoriatic arthritis group, but perhaps not for early onset. So my approach to early onset psoriatic arthritis is in the absence of data to the contrary, and given questions as to whether or not early onset psoriatic arthritis even resembles spinal arthritis, it seems reasonable to treat early onset psoriatic arthritis similarly as we do oligo and polyarthritis for JAA. And to that, I would refer to the 2019 guidelines that we published. Specifically, methotrexate is recommended as first line therapy. TNF inhibitors are recommended for patients with inadequate response to methotrexate without any preference among individual TNF inhibitors. If there is no response to an initial TNF inhibitor, we recommend switching to a different mechanism of action. Specifically, the guidelines spoke to abatacept and tesalizumab. Tofacitinib was not mentioned in these guidelines, although it now has indication for JIA. An important point here is that both abatacept and tesalizumab are not widely used for psoriatic arthritis in general. What about late onset psoriatic arthritis or enthesitis related arthritis? Here, I will um, speak to recommendations that were published in 2015 by the GRAPA group, and they will be updated shortly. And they speak to domains of psoriatic arthritis which drive treatment. And they, their primary domains were listed here, enthesitis, purpural and axial arthritis, dactylitis, nail disease, and psoriasis. Of special mention, which I believe in children are would be considered pr of primary importance, are uveitis and inflammatory bowel disease. Why is this concept important? Because disease features do not respond equally well to therapies. Therapeutics that are highly effective in one domain may have no effect or even worsen a second. So this is summarized over here. 
The domains I am highlighting in this slide are inflammatory bowel disease, peripheral spondylar arthritis, axial spondylar arthritis, psoriasis, and uveitis. So NSAIDs may be effective for peripheral and certainly for axial spondylar arthritis, not for the other domains. Traditional DMARGs are not a benefit for axial spinal arthritis. The soluble TNF receptor, etanercept, works for arthritis and psoriasis, but not as well for the complications, including IBD and uveitis. The same is true for IL-17 inhibition. The TNF monoclonal antibodies work across the board here. Anti-L1223 or anti-L23 works for IBD, peripheral spinal arthritis, and psoriasis, but not for axial spinal arthritis, and it has not been well studied in uveitis. The JAK inhibitors work for most of these domains, but their usefulness in uveitis remains uncertain. t cell stimulation inhibitors work for purple spinal arthritis and possibly for uveitis, and the PD4 inhibitors likewise work for purple spinal arthritis and psoriasis, but not the other domains. So to summarize, TNF inhibitors and cyclokinumab are effective in psoriatic juvenile arthritis and emphysitis-related arthritis. With the exception of early-onset psoriatic arthritis, we can extrapolate from the adult data for PSA and ERA, in order to be focused on key domains such as psoriasis, uveitis, IBD, and axial spinal arthritis. What about the outcome of juvenile spinal arthritis? I will begin with the good news. Overall, in the last two or three decades, we are using more biologics in JIA as a whole, and we're seeing better outcomes. This study looked at articular and extraarticular damage. An example of extraarticular damage was uveitis and consequences thereof, and both have decreased over time over the last two to three decades overall in children with arthritis. Now the bad news. Spinal arthritis is lagging behind. This study from Norway evaluated long-term data from 55 patients with ERA matched to 55 patients with oligo or polyarticular JIA. They looked at the health status after a median of 15 years. DMARD use was fairly infrequent in both groups, although more common in the ERA patients. Despite that, those with ERA had more disability, lower physical function scores, and more body pain. Similar trends were reported in psoriatic arthritis by the same group. This was after both 15 and 23 years from diagnosis. Again, the patients with PSJIA were more likely to use DMARs and prednisone, but despite that, they had worse function and more pain. At a single center, Tim Buchelman looked at 88 children with JIA who had been treated with a TNF inhibitor of those, the majority had a form of spinal arthritis. What he found is that the patients with ERA were less likely to have obtained remission compared to those with oligo or polyarticular JIA. In addition, he reported that baseline antistatus negatively predicted remission status, which was seen in only 25% of those with antistatus versus nearly half of those without. Likewise, Pam Weiss looked at pain intensity and health status from the CARA database. She was able to evaluate over 2,500 patients with JIA, of whom about 400 had spinal arthritis. And what she found is that ERA patients reported highest pain intensity and highest pain frequency, even after adjusting for medication use and other factors. This was also seen in a Canadian study this included 916 patients with JAA, of whom about 150 had spinal arthritis. Their outcome was inactive disease within one year among those who are not receiving early biologics or triple therapy. And what they found was that having ERA or sero seropositive polyarticular JIA were associated with reduced likelihood of remission. Dr. Rumsey has also reported that among children with JIA as a whole, whether or not they had ERA, having antisitis at baseline was associated with worse patient reported outcomes after five years. 
is summarize the outcome data. Temporal trends show better outcomes over time for all categories of children with JIA. However, children with ERA and possibly psoriatic arthritis are at greater risk for poor functional outcome and pain despite similar patterns of advanced medication use. And that implies that we need improved targets for endocitis. Thank you. Now we'll proceed with post-test questions. First question, which of the following conditions is not typically considered in the Junal spondyloarthritis family of related diseases? Answer choices, A, enthesitis-related arthritis, B, juvenile psoriatic arthritis, C, juvenile ankylosing spondylitis, D, chronic recurrent multifocal osteomyelitis, and E, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Please answer now. The results is uh, systemic juvenile idiopathic arthritis. Question two. Which of the following can be challenging to interpret on the pelvic MRI in skeletally immature patients? Choose all that apply. Answer choices. A, bone marrow edema. B, fat metaplasia. C, erosion. D, capsulitis. Please answer now. And the correct responses are bone marrow edema and erosion. Now, the last question. Which of the following statements is correct? Answer choices. Compared to adults, children are at higher risk of developing serious infections following exposure to TNF inhibitors. IL-17 inhibition with agents such as brodalumab or secukinumab is generally contraindicated in children with inflammatory bowel disease. Baseline enthesitis is a predictor of improved functional outcomes in children with JIA and D, Children with ERA are more likely compared to children with other categories of JIA to enter remission following exposure to TNF inhibition. Please answer now. And the correct response is IL-17 inhibition with agents such as brodalumab or secukinumab is generally contraindicated in children with inflammatory bowel disease. And now uh, we'll move on to panel discussion. First of all, I would like to welcome all our panelists. Thank you all so much for such great presentations. While we await for audience to pose their questions, I'm going to start off with some questions of my own. My first question is uh, to Dr. Ramsey. You mentioned about the challenges with the classification system of JSPA. Can you tell us how this has impacted patient care in your own experience? This is a good question. I think like sometimes it's hard to classify these patients. And then if you follow the ILR criteria very specifically, sometimes they end up with this undifferentiated category. So in terms of how it's impacted care, I guess it's kind of not a very satisfying label, first of all, for the patients and families to have is like undifferentiated. Sometimes it can impact the, the kind of approvals of medications if we can't Call them by a certain name. That might be some ways, but these are. This is being worked on, and it's like recognized that this is an issue. And in the new classification criteria, they're trying. To, people are trying to address this. So, good question. Thanks. Thank you so much. Looks like the audience is still shy. Uh, I'll proceed with my next question. This question is for Dr. Wise. Um, can you please speak to the role of IV contrast in MRI of sacroiliac joints? Uh, sure, that, that's, a, that's a great question. And um, I think it's one that lots of um, pediatric providers have across the country because practice is still relatively not standard. Um, the adult practitioners for quite a while now have um, not been using 
IV contrast, particularly when the imaging is done um, for the primary purpose of determining whether there's inflammatory disease at the SIJs. Um, and studies have been done in adults to show that that um, wall contrast um, adds the benefit of being able to see the actual joint lining um, and or fluid better than non-contrast studies. Um, in terms of determination of sacroiliitis being there or not, it actually does not add any incremental value. A um, couple of years ago, um, there were two studies that actually showed something very similar in the pediatrics um, realm, again, showing that um, the addition of contrast really didn't enhance our ability to detect sacroiliitis or not. Um, and that's a big deal for um, kids because um, most, most normal kids really don't like being poked with an IV, um, especially if they don't, um, it doesn't need to be done um, to enhance the, the evaluation of the imaging. Um, the additional sequences that are required for contrast add a lot of extra cost and time in the MRI scanner, which can also be a big deal for kids too. So, so in general, at least at, at my institution, when we're imaging primarily for inflammatory sacroiliitis, um, we do not use contrast. Thank you so much. That was um, a great um, information. My next question is for Dr. Stuhl. Uh, you showed data about how baseline enthesitis is a poor predictor for disease remission. Do you have any hypothesis as to why that might be? Um, I think the enthesitis is difficult to treat. Just anecdotally, experientially, I've found that often it can be unsatisfying. And there may also be a lot of overlap between more central pains and peripheral enthesitis. That might be part of it as well. The data was actually Dr. Rumsey's that I used for um, this talk, so maybe he may have some insight into this as well. No, I, I agree with what you're saying. There's a lot of overlap with uh, central sensitization syndrome, so sometimes it's difficult to diagnose enthesitis, and sometimes there's like comorbid pain syndrome, so that's part of the issue too. And it's often not imaged, so I mean, with imaging, sometimes it's easier to tell if there's true enthesitis, but it's not often done, it's in, often impractical. Thank you both. My next question is for Asad and Amina. In your experience, what were the most important factors for you in choosing a particular treatment regimen for Asad? And what information do you think would be important for clinicians to share with their patients when discussing different treatment options? So, well, I, I think for me, um, the first anti-TNF agent I was put on uh, worked perfectly, and it has worked ever since. Um, I've been lucky enough that uh, the pain has not ever flared back or the anti-TNF agent has stopped working. So we've never really had to uh, change the treatment. I've also taken methotrexate once a week. And so for, our, for me, I never had to change the treatment, but uh, I think for like other people who also have uh, spondyloarthritis, they probably uh, have had to change, you know, uh, try out different treatments to see which works the best for them. So, um, and just to add to that, uh, you know, when we were uh, with, through his uh, with Russ's journey, it was uh, initially quite overwhelming. However, when we discussed with our physician, um, just the treatment options, research, um, just understanding more of the disease and treatment, just getting a good education background in terms of what has worked, what has not worked. Uh, we felt a lot more comfortable um, going forward, just getting um, more education on the subject. So that just helped us feel more in control and um, more empowered going forward with his treatment. Thank you both for sharing that with us. Um, my next question is for Dr. Wise. Can you please share with us any new research being done to identify axial disease more readily in children? Hmm. Well, I think um, that's a great question and one I did not anticipate. <laughs> there, um, there's actually, there's some work, um, I can't speak to unpublished studies that other folks are doing, but there's some work that my group is doing to look at um, different imaging techniques to um, enhance our ability to differentiate between um, those tricky maturational changes that can fool all of us um, to see if there's a more 
uh, fail-proof way um, that uh, less experienced radiologists can, can look at um, and be able to tell more easily whether there's pathology there or not. And, and some of those imaging techniques include um, T2-weighted imaging um, and diffusion-weighted imaging. Great, thank you. Um, my next question is to Dr. Stoll. Um, can you please uh, share a little bit more about um, role of methotrexate or uh, rather lack of role of methotrexate um, in spondyloarthritis? So it's interesting that today, I spoke to the 2015 GRAPA guidelines, but just today, the some 20, revised 2021 guidelines were just published. And they spoke to that. They said there's conditional recommendations for it and peripheral. And this is on PSA. There's conditional recommendations for PSA, for antisodis, although they do recommend, if you're able to, to consider first-line treatment with a biologic. Um, having said that, I, th I think methotrexate does have some value in peripheral spinal arthritis. There's not very much data. I think most of the interest and in most of the data for peripheral SPA at least in um, antisthesis related arthritis or undifferentiated spa in adults, is with sulfasalazine. I do believe that methotrexate works. I've seen it work for peripheral. Again, for axial disease, I think the data are pretty clear that uh, traditional DMARDs, they may reduce morning stiffness, especially in the case of sulfasalazine, but traditional DMARDs are not all that effective. Thank you all so much. You gave such a great presentation and this has been a very enriching discussion. Um, I would like to invite the panelists to convey any parting message or take home points to the audience. I'm gonna first invite Asad and Amina. Well, um, so a parting message. Uh, okay, well, I think that uh, definitely uh, the, just in general, just like the rheumatolo like uh, the rheumatologists uh, have definitely changed my life. Basically, uh, when I when I first was diagnosed, I was it seemed very like overwhelming, and it's like, well, am I gonna have to live with this for the rest of my life? And basically, thanks to the rheumatologist, we've been able to you know find a treatment that works for me and. Hopefully, all the other doctors and rheumatologists in the world will continue doing research so we can help everyone else who's uh, in need, just like I used to be. And yeah, so just thank you to everyone. Uh, just to add to that, uh, yeah, just like I said, said uh, thank you so much. It's with all the treatment and guidance and support um, that we have come this way and we feel a lot more empowered um, through Inessa's journey. And of course, no one can, you know, everyone's journey is different, but um, as long as we follow our treatment plan, we feel, um, we feel in a much better space and we hope others can benefit from, you know, our stories. Thank you. Dr. Ramsey? Yes, thank you very much for everyone who attended. I think that a, a takeaway point would be it's important that doctors think of this diagnosis and try to think of it as a possibility because the earlier that we see these patients, the earlier they get treatment, the better, better they do. So if you see any patients with like what sounds like inflammatory back pain or like what seems to be enthesitis, like heel pain or pain around the knees, things like that, or if they have psoriasis or a family history of any of these conditions, it's important to try to get them referred as soon as possible so we can get them on early treatment. But that's my take home. Thanks. Thank you. Dr. Weiss? Um, I'll, I'll keep my parting message focused on imaging since that was what my talk was on. Um, but in terms of, you know, when, when and if you um, have suspicion for axial disease, imaging plays such an important role because there's so many different things that can cause pain in the in the low back um, that can be misdiagnosed as spinal arthritis too. And I think we really want to do our due diligence and, and treat the kids uh, with the best treatment possible to get them back into their normal activities. And if that means starting a biologic because they have inflammatory disease, then we should do it. Um, but if it's from a medication that they're taking for their acne, then we need to get them off of that and feeling better. And, um, and if it's from central pain and not from sacred 
sarcoiditis, so we need to get them into physical therapy and, uh, and counseling to help them. So I think there's a big differential, and, and a lot of the recent work has really shown that imaging is really the best thing that we have um, to differentiate those. Um, the second major message is it's really important to work with um, imaging experts that are used to looking at imaging in children um, because the low back in, in kids, especially in the peripubertal er, um, era, looks so different than an adults. And, uh, and it's just, it's so helpful to have somebody who's used to looking at those normal maturational changes. Thank you. And finally, Dr. Stuhl. All right. Well, thank you all very much for organizing this. So my parting message is that until about 10 years ago, it didn't really matter a whole lot what you called it, except for maybe epidemiologic purposes. But now that we have so many targeted therapies, that really matters how we identify it. And if you identify some pits on the fingernails or recognize dactylitis and you call it psoriatic, that's going to open up a whole bunch of pathways, treatment pathways, including some that are recently approved in children that you would, might not otherwise consider for other varieties of arthritis. And what we call in children often influences what the adults diagnose them with when they inherit this patient. So it's really important to be thoughtful as when we make these diagnoses. Thank you all so much. Now we have some uh, last um, announcements before we conclude this webinar. So in, if you liked today's webinar, please check out uh, patient and clinician podcasts related to the same topic that uh, have now been released and are available at the link provided. Uh, they can also be accessed through the National Psoriasis Foundation website. And also, please stay tuned for future seminars. Next slide, please. With uh, these topics uh, that are going to be released over the up upcoming months. Next slide. This program is accredited for 1.5 AMA uh, PRA Category 1 credits. To earn CME for this program, you must complete the evaluation. You may do so in a few ways. Shortly, the evaluation will fly over the screen so that you can complete it right now. That's the easiest way to do it. You may also access the evaluation by clicking the direct link in the slide deck, clicking the link in the menu, or scanning the QR code. If you're not able to complete the evaluation now, the link will also be sent to you in a post-event email. And once you've completed your evaluation, a CME certificate will be mailed to you within a week. Next slide. Thank you all once again um, for attending the seminar. Thank you again for all the panelists for such an enriching discussion. Thanks to the patients and families for sharing your journey with Juna Spondyl Arthritis with us today. Thanks to the audience for your participation. We would also like to thank Spartan, Grappa, SAA, and NPF for putting together this um, seminar series. Finally, thanks to Pfizer, without whose educational grant, this program would not have been possible.